series. Today, we're going to talk about recovery and how to get back up and running faster. If the clicker works, there we go. Uh, hey, real quick housekeeping note. If you have any questions, enter those down here into the Q&A panel. That helps me uh, keep track of all the questions and make sure that I can answer them for you. I'll be answering those at the end of the session. Uh, if you ask a question, you're, enter, you're entered to win a prize. That prize is a $50 Amazon gift card. And this is all being recorded. You'll get a link in your email afterwards. So if you have to step away, you want to show someone else, you want to actually complete the four-part epic mini series around ransomware and turn it into a fully full-length feature movie, uh, send me a link to that so I can show my mom and say that I was in a movie at some point. Uh, but this is also going to be on our website, go.expedient.com slash webinar replays, youtube.com slash expedient, instagram.com slash underscore expedient, twitter.com slash expedient, and linkedin.com slash company slash expedient. Go ahead and give us a follow on social media because sometimes you'll learn things that we're going to talk about next week before we talk about them. Wink, nudge, we'll talk more about that in a bit. For those of you who are new to Expedia, we started in 2001. Today, we have 12 data centers in eight cities. In 2007, we started our virtual co-location process to provide virtual, co or virtual hosting for customers. This is really before virtualization takes hold. And we've been doing virtual hosting in our cloud since 2007, which is around the same time as AWS EC2. In 2015, we released Push Button DR. As customers got more and more virtualized, it became easier to provide DR services for external customers. They didn't have to worry about physical hardware. And so we were able to solve bigger problems for them, like how to fail over your networks without any sort of impact. In 2018, we released our enterprise cloud to provide a full cloud operating model without all of the refactoring with a fully uh, functional HTML5 interface, REST API, and a full consumption-based model to provide our next generation of cloud. In 2020, we released our cloud native platform to provide next generation app modernization capabilities with fully managed Kubernetes, application observability, and persistent container storage. And that lives right on top of our enterprise cloud. So your next generation applications work right next to your current applications to help you along that modernization process. And this year, we've been focusing on multi-cloud and how to enable service across any cloud anywhere. And you'll notice that all of those releases have been getting closer and closer together because we're accelerating with the rest of the industry. And over the course of our ransomware series, we've been talking about how to protect and detect at every level, right? We talked about endpoint security and how protecting at the end user layer with you know, behavior-based and signature-based protection is incredibly important to stop processes before they get started with our multi-cloud firewall consistently protecting workloads and threat against threats, both inbound and outbound, regardless of what cloud or what workload location it runs on. Our micro segmentation is capable of running on any infrastructure to help contain the blast radius of a ransomware attack. And all of these are capable of feeding their logs slash snitching into our SIM to provide you a holistic view of your security environment, regardless of cloud. And even last week, we talked with Oliver Schmidt about crisis management. It's like disaster recovery on steroids. What does your organization do when you have a ransomware attack or any other data breach? And how do you respond overall and how it's more than just the technology? I highly recommend taking a look at the, any of the webinars that you may have missed around our ransomware series, and especially the crisis management one, because I found it incredibly interesting to think about this at a bigger level, not just oh no, something's happened, how do we get back online? But let's say that the worst has happened, right? We have a ransomware attack that has gotten through all of the protection layers that we have. We've detected that it happened. We started to enact some of our crisis management response, but the worst has now happened. What do we do about that? What do we, where do we start? What do we wanna do? Well, we need to take a step back and we need to think about disasters. Because you have a recovery plan, right? We talked about that last week with crisis management. We talk about disaster recovery all the time, but you have a disaster recovery plan, right? It's kind of time to pull that out. Because when we think about recovery, we start to think about disasters. And disaster recovery planning has always long been something that just lives inside of IT. And there's some business continuity aspects to it, but it's largely been an IT function. Because Things can go wrong. And when we start thinking about disaster recovery planning, we think about what could go wrong. 
And most of the time people, their minds turn to natural disasters, right? Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, floods, these sorts of large scale forces of nature that can take your business and organization offline. And they're not great. The problem with natural disasters is that they don't happen terribly often. They are a once in a generation if they're that bad, or they're once a decade if you live in an area like uh, the Southeast with tornadoes or the Midwest with tornadoes or the East Coast with hurricanes uh, or the Gulf Coast with hurricanes and flooding where your area and propensity is largely what determines how much you have to think about natural disasters. It's not a very consistent way of thinking about it. Another one is power outages. The power goes out from time to time, right? A windstorm comes through. It's not necessarily going to destroy your building. It's not going to tear up uh, anything that's out there, but it may, a tree limb may come down on a power line. We have considerations around power outages, right? We have UPS that can hold up our workloads for a brief period of time before our generators kick in. We have those capabilities to mitigate a power outage. But really the big one that most people can think of with whom human error with disaster recovery is human errors. And my good friend, the North American free range fiber eating backhoe. Um, some of you may have seen this. You might have your own story, a uh, truck backed up into a pole. Uh, my personal is uh, that a dump truck with bed raised took down an overhead line. That's a very fun, like three days worth of work. But these are all things that can be repaired. Right? A natural disaster, things can be repaired. A power outage, things can be repaired. Human errors, things can be repaired. And in most of these situations, you're probably not going to hit the disaster recovery button unless you absolutely have to. But we need to think about a different type of disaster, which is ransomware and malicious attacks. And when we think about malicious attacks, I want you to think about this in how people want to respond to ransomware attacks. Because everybody says, oh, well, if I get hit with a ransomware attack, Nope, I'm not, I'm not paying. I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. Let's take a look at some examples. City of Atlanta gets hit with a ransomware attack. The ransomware, the ransom was like $50,000. They ended up paying $9 million in various, to various recovery firms, service providers and such to bring all of their things back online. And it took them months to do it. Okay, City of Baltimore. $80,000 ransom, they end up paying $18 million to recover from all of their various systems. And it took them months. And even six months later, there were still systems that were offline due to the ransomware attack. And Lake City, Florida said, actually, we will be paying the ransom because we don't have the ability to recover. And they paid $460,000 in ransom because it was cheaper than fixing it. And so these are all situations where they said, no, we're not going to pay, or at least Atlanta and Baltimore were th issues where they were not going to pay. And they decided, no, 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 we're going to recover. We can do this. And ended up paying way more to actually go do that. Lake City said it was cheaper to just pay them and move on. So we have to think this through in terms of how do we actually enable a better recovery? This is where our disaster, disaster recovery as a service comes in. Because... Ransomware is a disaster. In fact, it's the most prevalent disaster. We've mentioned this fact a couple of times that there's a ransomware attack that happens every 11 seconds through the course of this webinar, over the course of the next you know, 20 minutes until we get to about 1 p.m. Eastern, there will be 163 attacks from when we started to when we finish. That's a lot, right? That's bananas. There's not 163 hurricanes a year. There's 163 attacks that'll happen within this 30 minute time period. That's wild. And so we have to consider ransomware as a disaster and include it in our disaster recovery plans. We have to consider it as possibly the most likely thing to happen. Now, why am I talking about disaster recovery? Because this is the fastest response. If you wanna get back up and running like that, you need to have a system and a platform that is built to do that. And that's what disaster recovery platforms have been built to do forever. But when we think about this, we need to think about what are we actually recovering? Because most disaster recovery platforms, most disaster recovery services are really only protecting our mission critical systems. So it's a blend of systems beyond disaster recovery that we'll be talking about to actually do the full recovery. Because disaster recovery relies on testing. It relies on your applications being able to recover. It relies on them being able to recover even going back in time. 
We're our, with our disaster recovery solution, we have a journaling based process and we can extend the journaling out so that you can go back in time so that if it's you know Thursday morning at 8 a.m. is when the attack started or usually it starts before that because why do things during business hours? If it starts at 5 a.m. on Thursday, I can go back to Wednesday at 9 p.m., recover my workloads. I only lose a very short amount of data and I can actually get things back up and running and have an opportunity to clean out the malware before it activates. This is an opportunity for you to do that. And when you utilize a disaster recovery as a service solution with Expedient, we can even do things like give you additional resource space that's clean to recover into. This is a big capability that most people on-prem just don't have the capability to do. But you need to test your workloads. You need to test them often. If you're not testing your disaster recovery plans at least once a year, if not once every six months, you probably are not going to have a good time when you go to hit that button. So please do me a favor. If you take nothing away from this, please test your disaster recovery plans. Please test and make sure that they actually work and that they come up and are online. And if you need some help with that, give me a call. Next is data protection. And data protection is effectively the longer term. Disaster recovery is very much a uh, short period of time that you have to recover. You need to be able to bring things back online very quickly, but you don't exactly have a terribly long tail from which to recover from. With data protection, we can go back even further. And this is using things like immutable backups. So we can do things like protect the backups themselves from being overwritten. One of the more clever things that happened with ransomware attacks over the last, I'd say five years, is that they started going after backup systems. They started going after these platforms because they know that if you have backups that you can recover from, you're not paying. And a non-paying customer, and I'm using the most aggressive air quotes I can, a non-paying customer of ransomware is not worth the time and can likely get you into deeper water. They want to get in, get you to pay and get out. And so if you can recover, there's forensics, you can now be found out. And this whole uh, organization that you have of uh, basically extorting money from companies no longer works anymore. So immutable backups is what the data protection industry has come around to saying, hey, this is a way for us to protect our workloads. This is a write once, read many type of platform. You want to look at something to say, okay, I'm dropping this backup in and nothing can touch it until my retention period is up and then it can be deleted. This gives you protection to be able to bring your workloads back online easily and know that they are safe and that they haven't been deleted by an attacker who has breached your network. The challenge here is creating longer rotations. We've seen customers where they've had a ransomware attack where the infection happened in August. If you wanna go back and learn this whole story, I recommend going and finding our national auto care from hack to back in 48 hours. Uh, it's a webinar we did back in January. Uh, they are a customer of ours utilizing our data protection and our disaster recovery platform along with EEC. And we were able to get them back up and running in about 48 hours. The long rotation period is key because their infection happened in August. The actual attack didn't start until October. It sat there dormant for two months. This is to allow it to infect the backups and to get that back up and running. So you may need to extend your rotations so that you have a nice long runway of data to be able to recover from. Because even if you lose two months worth of data, it's better than losing all of it forever. And finally, we have object storage. And object storage seems like a weird one here. Now, if you watched our object storage webinar, you know where I'm about to go with this. But when we start talking about object storage, that sounds like a primary storage platform, right? That's Amazon S3, that's Azure Blob Storage. You know, why would I want to use object storage in a data protection scenario? Well, when we think about the concept of 321 backups, object storage becomes a really interesting sort of uh, function. When I, see three, when I say three, two on backups, I mean you have three copies of your data, two of them on premises, one of them off premises. And premises can be wherever it needs to be. You have one local copy and one remote copy. Um, but when we, when we think about this, why do we have two on prem? That seems weird. Well, if you have a file that gets deleted, or a database that gets deleted, or a VM that gets deleted, or a whole you know, storage platform that gets deleted, being able to recover locally in your own facility or in your own VPC or in your own cloud enables you to get back up and running faster. 
right? You don't have to worry about data latency or data speeds or your internet connectivity. You're able to get back up and running faster. And that's where the two comes in. But that one has always been a challenge because when most people think of their backups or trying to archive or get their backups off site, they've always needed to have a second copy of that platform that lives somewhere else. So now you're in the same, the same sort of boat that disaster recovery platforms are in, where you have to maintain a second platform, you have to maintain a second piece of software, you have to maintain all of that hardware. When your on-prem backup platform grows, your secondary backup platform has to grow. And so it turns into this additional infrastructure that nobody really wants to manage. When Amazon had S3 come out, people started to say, well, wait a minute, that's just a place to dump stuff. There's no file system that I have to think about. There's nothing that I have to consider as part of that. It is literally just a place where I can shove data. Huh. And all of the backup vendors thought the same thing. So Cohesity, Rubrik, Commvault, NetBackup, all of the major backup vendors have the ability to do S3 out. And with Expedience Cloud Object Storage, we are an S3 compatible storage platform. So we can do things like long-term archive or off-site backups to get your data off-site and get it into a safe location where nothing can touch it because nothing knows that it's there. It's a bucket that only has access through the API key that you give it. And this is a really powerful way to keep your data in a safe location in case the worst thing in the world happens. I like to call this the oh no option. And in my brain, I'm not saying oh no, I'm saying other words. And you can feel free to think about what those might be. It might be fiddlesticks, might be hamburgers, might be something else. But this is the oh no option. Everything has gone very wrong. My disaster recovery is corrupted. My backups are corrupted. And this is a way to restore very quickly and easily. One of the nice parts about our object storage platform is that we don't have egress fees. So there's nothing that you have to pay. If you put 50 terabytes of data into our platform, you do not have to pay 50 terabytes in egress fees to get it back out, which is usually the hidden cost of any sort of cloud storage platform. And so by being able to bring all of these together, I have a really powerful platform that we can build off of to get our recovery to work faster and get things back up and running as quickly as possible. And when we pair these recovery platforms with our protection and detection platforms, you get an end-to-end -end capability for ransomware that gives you peace of mind. And by the way, all of these individual pieces of technology, you know, endpoint security, firewall, microsegs, SIM, DR, cloud data protection, object storage, all of these for you as an administrator or you as an organization would take months, if not years to build and a ton of capital that you would have to front to go build all of the storage, buy all of the software, get all of the training, get it all up and running. And we can make it simple and offer it to you as a service so that you don't have to think about maintaining and patching a platform that you've never seen before we have an entire staff of folks that are capable of doing that. And you're able to get in much more granularly. So things like SIM are usually a very expensive, very large platform to build, and we sell it in gigs of RAM and gigs of storage. You can get in at a much more granular level and enable your organization regardless of size. And when we pair all of this together, it's really, really powerful for us to be able to do this. And by the way, this isn't all a technology play. I like to talk about all the technology and all the capabilities that we have in our services, but there's also a ton of people here at Expedient, right? There's a whole row of cubes behind this glass. There's an entire data center here, and this is one of 12. We have hundreds of people on our staff that are building these platforms every single day. They are supporting them every single day, and they are supporting our users. That whole hack the back thing with National Auto Care, one of our engineers sat on the phone for 16 hours helping them do restores. That's the key here, is that not only is there a ton of technology and capability, but there's a whole staff of people here when, ready to help you when you need it. And I'm really, really proud to be part of this organization because it's incredible to work with all of these people day in and day out who really truly want the best for everyone. This is all part of our cloud safer, our cloud safer mentality. By being able to protect our workloads, regardless of workload location, with firewall, microseg, SIM, identity, and endpoint security, you're able to have a holistic security platform to be able to work off of and be able to secure things consistently with an intent-based model across all of your workload locations. So what's next? You can go to expedient.com slash services slash assessments 
And you can sign up for a free cloud assessment to learn what's the right cloud for your workloads and use our subject matter experts to help you along your cloud journey. And I've never really talked about this before, and that's on me. We also do DR assessments. So we will sit down and go through your disaster recovery plan and understand what are your pain points and what can be done to actually make your disaster recovery plans better. Both of those are free to you. You can also go to expedience.com slash services slash multi-cloud to see our full cloud different message and see how we can accelerate your cloud journey with our whole Expedient Control list suite of services to get you to where you want to go faster. Now, remember how I mentioned you should follow us on social media and you should go do that? Twitter.com slash Expedient, LinkedIn.com slash company slash Expedient. You should go do those things because you would have heard this already. But please come back and join us next week. I'm so very excited to tell you all about Expedient Enterprise Workspace. This is our fully managed virtual desktop infrastructure as a service to help you work different. Um, I've personally been working with the team uh, on this for the last like six months. And I'm really, really excited about it. I have a really cool demo to show everybody. We're gonna dive deep on how it works, what you can do with it and how to drive your work, your work from home and hybrid work forward with a platform that works with you. Um, with that, I will open it up for questions. Again, I'm very excited for all of these platforms uh, and all of the things that we've been doing over the last uh, month. It is on the 7th. Thank you uh, to my counterpart, Liz. Liz pointed out it's on the 7th. The graphic says it's the 6th. It is on the 7th. So thank you, Liz. It is on the 7th. Is there a limit to journal length? Um, yes, there is. A, I mean, the limit is based on the amount of storage that you would have uh, assigned to that. But that is configurable. So if you want to have a really long journal, uh, it's just a matter of extending the storage to be able to handle um, to be able to handle the journal link that you would like to get to. That's also, I'll say, um, that is very much an it depends sort of answer, just to be clear, um, because it's based on your rate of change and it's based on how many workloads you're putting in there. So if you have a workload that doesn't change very often, you're, you could have a very small amount of data storage and have an incredibly long journal because there's not a ton of change. If you have like a transactional database inside of there that changes all the time, your journal will likely be shorter and you'll need to add more storage to that. Uh, I'm not aware of any caps on it. So please uh, go ahead and, and get, reach out to us and we can kind of talk through your exact requirements that, that you're uh, looking there. Is there a long-term retention option where you don't need the exact granular restore? Um, that is more of the object storage platform. Uh, so if you're just trying to get all of your data to be from here and go somewhere else, that's object storage, which we can do with S3 out. Who do, how do you determine the cost for a DR assessment? Um, it's free. That's it. Um, <laughs> we can work out uh, what you need to do. Please reach out to me uh, or you can go to our website and click on Let's Talk or go to expedient.com slash services slash assessment and sign up. And we can talk through what it is that you're looking to do from a DR assessment. Uh, but you have subject matter experts from Expedient that can help you through those things. Is this platform viable for fully cloud enabled workforces? Absolutely. You still need to have something that you're talking to. You still need to have some sort of a uh, desktop. We'll talk about all of the reasons around our uh, Expedient Enterprise Workspace and, and what the best use cases are for it. Uh, uh, pretty much all of them, uh, all of the things that we're doing, Zoom and Teams, that sort of stuff. Uh, we've all taken uh, account of all of that. So fully cloud enabled workforces, if you say, hey, we don't have offices anymore, this is a really great way to bring some of that centralized management and overall maintenance back in line uh, and eliminate some of those data storage compliance uh, issues that you might have. So please tune in next week. Uh, if you want to learn more, just come back next week. I'll be talking about it. I'm very, very excited to do that. Uh, with that, I believe that is all of the questions. I clicked the wrong thing. I was trying to get back into PowerPoint. Um, but that is our time for this week. I'm very excited to talk to you all next week, October 7th, around introducing Expedient Enterprise Workspace. We have a ton still to come this year. Uh, we have a really exciting announcement towards the end of October. We have some more announcements coming before the end of the year. Stay tuned. It's going to be fun, I promise. Thanks, and have a great week.